Hello, brothers and sisters. Long time no see, right? Um, there, I have had um, another couple of, of visions, and they are, uh, I think they're, I think they go along with the uh, God dreams that I have been having. And I think it's just one more kind of, I guess, from my standpoint, a final push for us to see this. Everybody, come on in. This is not going to be a long one. And when I say that, it's going to be, it's not going to be long in comparison to my other videos, okay? So, but I think it is extremely important. Let me go ahead and say quickly a prayer uh, for leading of Holy Spirit. Uh, dear Abba, we just want to praise you, thank you, and glorify your name and lift you up. You are so worthy to be praised. And and worthy of all of the honor and glory. We want to thank you for this opportunity to be able to come together today. And Lord, I'm asking that that Holy Spirit will be able to work through me to say the words that are going to make the strongest impact that is going to be able to deliver the message you want your people to receive. And I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, folks. I've I've had a couple of visions and and there are two different visions and it relates specifically to the separation of the bride of Christ from the body of Christ. Now we're we're going to go into that because there 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 are a uh, a lot of people that are drawing sides as it were uh, and and they don't want to either it, it seems to me that they either are open to receiving the revelation of the three harvest events or the three raptures, whichever term you you want to be able to use or or they do not. I mean, it's it's it, it's almost becoming like it's an all or nothing type of approach. Well, uh, I, I think in this particular instance, what I want to do, let me start out with some scripture so I can lay some context, and then I'm going to give you uh, what has what the vision that I've been given. Okay. All right. And since this is in relation, as I have titled this, the separation of the bride of Christ from the body of Christ. And, uh, and what I want to uh, hopefully, hopefully show, what I'm hopefully doing in presenting this is to have, have anyone that has an opposing view that there's there's only one rapture and and everybody that even knows how to pronounce the name Jesus they're going right and and that's where it's going that I'm being facetious of course but you understand uh exactly what I'm saying but let me tell you what uh I believe and that's what I've been teaching for for quite some time, is that the bride of the Christ is not equal to the body of Christ. It's not an either or. They're not. They're not synonyms uh, for each other. They're. Uh, they're not like just interchangeable terms. The bride of Christ actually comes from. It's a subset of the body of Christ. They are part of the body of Christ, but they are separate out of it. They are pulled out of that. And, and here's what I want you to see about all of this, okay? I'm going to start by reading 
uh, some scriptures that that show union. OK, and then and then we're going to uh, cover some differences with that. So first, let's start off. I'm going to read out of Genesis chapter two, and I'm going to read verses 21 through 25. <clears throat> I had read a part of this in my message yesterday, but I, I, I want to focus on one particular aspect, and that is where my vision has come in. So starting Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. <clears throat> Excuse me, just a moment. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And what I want to focus on in, in this video today is verse number 24, because it is throughout the Bible. It's mentioned in several places. It's meant to and it's repeated over and over, and it's all about the bride, right? Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Well, all right. Well, we've got that word cleave there, and I want you to highlight that, okay? I want you to go now to Matthew 19. And again, I'm reading from the King James Version, uh, but I'm just going to read verses three through six. Matthew 19, verses three through six. The Pharisees also came unto him, to Jesus, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, or two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, you notice uh, again, uh, and we highlight, it's the very same uh, uh, verse that was in Genesis chapter 2. Now we see it again in Matthew uh, chapter 19. And, and I want to now focus not just on the uh, cause for a man and leaves father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, the two shall be one flesh. Yes, that's very important. That's our big umbrella statement. But I want to look at the word cleave in this instance, because this relates so strongly to the vision and the bride and the body. Now, what I want to do is I want to bring your attention to uh, the Bible dictionary. And what I did is I went to find out the definition or to get the definition of the word cleave, right? And, uh, and because I want to show that the Bible uses it two different ways. There's actually a number of words that are not only in the Hebrew and the Greek, but also in English that have 
one meaning and its exact opposite meaning as part of the meaning of the very same word. Now, this is important, okay? So once again, what I'm trying to say is that we may have a word that two meanings of the word may be opposites of each other. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Cleave is an example of one of those words. So this is what the Bible dictionary says about the word cleave. It's used in the Bible in two different senses. Baka means to split or to rend. We are told that Abraham clave the wood for the burnt offering in Genesis 22, 3, and that they clave the wood of the cart, 1 Samuel 6, 14. The psalmist speaks of Yahweh cleaving fountain and flood in Psalms 74, 15, and the plowman cleaving the earth in Psalms 141, verse 7. And then he says, for uh, or what they say here for other examples, see Judges 15, verse 19, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 9, Psalms 78, 15, Habakkuk 3, verse 9, and so forth. So there, there are a lot of instances in which the Bible is showing that uh, the word cleave is used to split into, to rid into, okay? But it also has another meaning, its exact opposite, uh, which means to adhere to, to join one's self to. This meaning is the reverse of the preceding. The psalmist speaks of his tongue cleaving to the roof of his mouth in Psalms 137, verse 6. We are told, and this is our focus here, that a man should cleave unto his wife in Genesis 2, 24, Matthew 19, point, uh, verse 5. Uh, and it, did I say point two four? Genesis 2, verse 24. I think you understand what I'm trying to say here, right? and Matthew 19, verse 5, that I just read to you, those two passages. It is said that Ruth clave unto her mother-in-law. That's in Ruth 1, verse 14, and that certain men clave unto Paul in Acts 17, verse 34. Compare Acts 4, 23, for example. Cleave is also it used in the sense to describe one's adherence to principles. Paul admonished the Romans to cleave to that which is good in Romans 12, verse 9. Now, so in this particular instance, the, re the big focal point that I'm wanting to get to here is that the word cleave is used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, in both, in both itself and its opposite meaning. And, uh, and, and so that's very important as we see it here. Again, I'm going to uh, now give you the visions. I've actually had two of them and it's getting stronger. So I had, uh, this vision and it and it wasn't like real strong because i've only had one waking vision but that was so strong that was uh back in july and that was about jesus calling uh me as a representative of the bride calling me up and taking me up it was so stunning. I have never had anything like that. That was just, I, I'm still amazed by it. I, I, I can't not be amazed by it. But since that time, I've had some other small visions, waking visions. They're not near as powerful as that one, but they are obvious and they are catching my attention. So in this, uh, uh, 
vision before this latest one, I saw the ground. I, I was I was actually reading. I was reading. I forget which uh, which passage I was reading at the time, but I was reading the word. And as I was reading the word, I just went to this image. This image replaced what I was seeing. And so rather than looking at the word, I see the ground and there's this ground and it's it's dry ground. It's it's not it's not uh, lush and, and it's not covered with uh, vegetation or anything. It was it was pretty dry. And I see this hand come out from, and it's very similar to the dream I had about Jesus, his hand coming over and scooping up the barley and taking it out, which was the rapture of the bride, because the bride is the barley. Okay, so that's that's one of, that's a different issue altogether. If you aren't familiar with that, there are plenty of teachings in which I cover that in great detail. I encourage you to check them out. But what this was, so in this same thing, a huge hand is coming out, and it's over my left shoulder, so it comes down like that, and it's a right hand, and uh, and in with white. And uh, it's the arm, and I can see this uh, white sleeve is what I'm trying to say. And in his hand is a large knife, and it's uh, it, it was a large silver knife, and uh, but it was sharp. It was very sharp. And it was it was long and had kind of a curved blade on it, almost like a you know like a a, a kitchen chef's knife or something. If you're familiar with those, except it was razor sharp, and I knew that it was. And here, take I watch on the line, and I see then the hand go through and put the knife on this earth, this dirt, and pull back. And it makes this very neat, clean cut. And that was it. The knife is pulled back and, and, and I didn't think anything about it. And, uh, and, but I was trying to figure out what does that mean? Okay, there's some kind of cutting. I, I just didn't have this full explanation. Obviously, it was God doing something. He was cutting something, but I didn't know what the something was. I didn't have that view. Well, after uh, I've done uh, a, a a couple of more messages and what has happened here yesterday, and this happened twice. So it happened earlier and it happened just a little bit ago. And I was actually, uh, I was doing some more study again and suddenly here's the same thing. Everything disappears and I see this ground and it is a, uh, uh, it's th still dry ground, but it's not, at, mm, how do I put it? it? It's not like dusty. Like, so the first one was almost like dust, you know, dry dust. But here it was like dried up ground. So in other words, it wasn't dusty, but it was hard packed ground, if that makes, if that is understandable. And then this arm of God, this arm that's coming out is Jesus, right? That's what I'm seeing here. This, that's my thing. Uh, arm of God. Let's just go ahead and leave it at that because I'm not seeing the face, but I do know it's the arm of God. And in his hand this time is not a chef's knife. It's a cleaver. And it's still, but it's huge. It is 
it, it's enormous. The arm, of course, is also enormous, and it's silver, just like the knife was. And instead of this time going in to slice and to make this very clean cut in the dust, this comes down and it's boom, and it makes this deep, deep cleaving separation in which this ground actually then separates. Okay. And I know that there's something that this ground is actually supposed to be alive. Okay. There's something that it represents the earthly body and, and not just a single body, but the earthly body of Christ. And so what, and I'm looking at this and I recognize that this, that there is this, in this splitting, there's a smaller piece that is on this side. And then there is a much larger piece that's on this side, but it's clearly completely separated, right? And uh, and so I then, I, I was asking, I was just like, and then that was the end of it. And then I come back to, to myself and I am, a, and I spoke to uh, 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 Sister Paulette, and, and, and I'm trying to be able to, to grapple with what this was because the message that I'm getting as I'm praying about it for the interpretation of what this meant is it meant that our earthly bodies altogether, that's, that's why it wasn't just one small piece. It's it's a huge piece, and of of clay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what I was trying to say. It's like this dried clay, right? That's what we are. That's we're vessels of clay, right? And that's what. And so, what's going to happen is what I was recognizing is that because it was a huge piece of land, earth, then it represented the entire body of Christ. And what is happening now is that the complete and total final separation of the bride of Christ from the body of Christ is now happening. That is happening right now. So initially, what would, so what this in fact means to me is that first there started with a division, a, a, a clean cutting, that there's going to be a clean cut that's going to take place. And, uh, and so that was what I was seeing first, but it was dry dust. So in other words, it, it wasn't completely formed yet, right? So, uh, so you can't, the bride is not going to be completely separated until right at the end. And this is what I'm seeing is that this is occurring right at the end. And okay, so let me interject something and I'm going to read some more scripture that's going to add some more to this, okay? Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. All right. The body, just like I read to you in Genesis chapter two, the first part is that there is a bride that is made for Adam from one part of the body, the part that's closest to his heart, 
his one of his ribs and not not the whole rib cage not, not not the top half of his body not not the whole thing and they just like do some kind of symbiotic breaking from one body into two bodies no what happens is god takes this one rib out and while he's in a deep sleep that simulates that's similar to death what do we call it we say that you know lazarus is asleep what does jesus say plainly he tells them lazarus is dead okay so we know that sleep is a euphemism for death and so that's what this is representing for the first adam and there is a rib this one small piece bone of my bone flesh of my flesh that is the bride that is then brought to him right and we see in jesus that we know the same thing is going to happen jesus is is uh, described as the second adam right and we know that there is a bride that is prepared why because it's not good for the man to be alone we uh, we as god is going to uh, create a help me for him so the same thing is going to happen here so what happens where is the bride that is made for jesus well there was a spear that pierced his side right in that same place where that rib from adam was taken and it pierced his heart and blood and water came out and from that from that sacrifice, from that, we know that the bride is being take, is being created. Now, here's another thing I want to point out, too. The father chooses the bride. Now, there are so many instances in the Bible. If you, if you say that that is not the case, then, uh, oh, my goodness then I would say that you have some other reason other than what the Bible seems to plainly lay out that Rebecca was chosen, wants the father go make sure that he chooses a bride for Isaac. Uh, there's, uh, there, there's just so many instances, just like, okay, God creates a bride for Adam here. We've, we've got too many instances of it. We see in Revelation, what is it, in chapter 20, where we have the bride that is for Jesus, right? We see it's just all through the Bible. It would just be too many instances to list, okay? And that's not the purpose of what I'm seeing here. What I want to say is that the father picks the bride. We see that also in the Jewish a wedding model and how many of us know about that the father picks the bride and a lot of times they have that and then they have this whole meeting the bride to be will then uh, of course either have the opportunity to accept or reject and and we see how all of that is uh and so a lot of that happens when the uh bridegroom to be then has an acceptance goes back to the father's house where there's going to be the uh the the wedding chamber is going to be built onto the father's house that's where the bride is going to come and that's where the marriage is going to take place on and on and on we see so much of that so i just want to cover that first but now let's go ahead and follow this up with some more scripture that shows that and from here what we're going to read out of ephesians chapter 5 and i'm going to read to you verses 22 through 33 okay and i'm giving then even broader context and we're going to see a lot of the same things all right so ephesians chapter 5 starting at verse 22 Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, 
and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. We see the connection there, right? It's, it's symbolic, a physical symbolism in which we see this spiritual reality. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. All right, so now we see there's the connection. There's the body. The body is the whole church, right? We see that. Now let's start in verse 28 as we continue on. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now, I want to just highlight that again. There is a corporate body. We all know that everybody has a different part in the body, the different part that they are, right? We're all members, we're all part of the body, but we're not all the same members, right? All right. But then he changes in verse 31 you're going to hear what we've been talking about this whole time. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, so what you need to do when you look at this, so that we, we see this other thing. We see the same thing that we saw in Genesis. We see the same thing that we saw in Matthew. And now we see it uh, exemplified here. But what are the differences? What we see here first is the Apostle Paul identifying that the body is composed of all kinds of different members, right? Then he identifies that, the, that he's speaking about Christ and the church. And when he talks about being joined unto his wife, that is not saying that the wife is the church. If you really look at that, what he's saying is that the wife is a member of the body, right? So there's going to be a, pa a part of the body, just like we see in Genesis. Which part was that? That was a rib from that particular instance. And, uh, and, and the same area in the instance from Jesus, right? So this is what he's saying, that Christ has a body. And from that body of Christ comes the church, uh, excuse me, the bride. The bride is a part of the church, but the bride is taken out of the church, just like the rib is taken out of the body of Adam, okay? So, still Adam's body, right? So, it's still Jesus's body, but the bride is taken out of that body. That's what I'm wanting you to see here, okay? And the same thing with the cleaving. So, I want to point out this is the final deal, 
final separation. Why is it a cleaver that I see this time? It's because it's doing both things. It's separating the bride from the body. And so that the bride is going to cleave to the bridegroom, and that's Jesus. And But at the very same time, it also has the same meaning of separating the bride from the rest of the body. Do you see? And I, I, I see that so strongly. Now, let me go ahead because there's going to be, there's a number of people that are, uh, that are not seeing this. And, and brothers and sisters, I'm not going to apologize for what, what I'm being shown and what I'm being asked to present because I am just being obedient to what I am being told. Now, I have noticed, and, and this was another thing because I have seen now the number of subscribers. Now, just, just as a point, I'm not doing this at all for numbers of subscribers at all. That's not what this is about. I'm just using this as an illustration. I have noticed as of late, then suddenly there are numbers. There's a lot of people that have been unsubscribing. Now, what I'm saying about that is, is I'm going hallelujah. Hallelujah, because what does that mean? There's the separation, because if you are going to be on that part, you're going to want to separate yourself from the, from the bride, but the bride is going to stay strong. The bride is not going to be anywhere but focused on Jesus. But then there's the other group. Now, let me give you an opposing uh, type of view so I can mention that because that's what I'm saying. Um, it's, it, it's, it's about this because some of the people, when they come in, they, they hear a part that I think that then they uh, are agreeable to when, when they hear how I discuss that uh, salvation is a free gift, and of course it is. It's so biblically uh, accurate, it should not even be questioned. Of course, that is the case. Salvation is a free gift. But then when they hear, wait a minute, your order in the resurrection or which rapture, which harvest event from the harvest model that you're going to be in is not a salvation issue, then suddenly they go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. And, and they uh, tend to get upset and draw back because they, there's many different reasons, but I think that uh, one of them, uh, a strong reason is they want to, in a number of instances, I'm not saying in all, but in a number of instances, they want to justify, one, why they don't have a deep love for Jesus, or two, why they are focused and want to continue to focus on the world and the things of the world, or three, that they don't feel the need to uh, uh, to repent of any sin that might be in their life because they don't feel a need to do so despite all the many scriptures that discuss that, okay? Now, as an illustration, I had uh, a response uh, to another person that... Uh, uh, and made a re was making a response to uh, our dear sister Sue Keith, <clears throat> and I just borrowed this. Now I'm going to not going to give the name of the person, but she was having a conversation with her, and very very godly uh, laying out the, uh, where we see the three, the pre mid and post tribulation harvest events taking place and so on and so forth. And uh, this person then uh, in one of the responses that she made 
was this, and I'm just going to read uh, part of it. I believe Jesus will not, not do partial judgment. I'm not near perfect as in the bride, but I have full faith that I'm part of the body of Christ. Now, the reason why I'm doing that is because these are instances in where you get the all caps. And this is also another thing. When 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 I or, or someone else like uh, Sister Sue actually respond to people, you know, you don't see us using all caps. Why is that? There's a reason for that, right? Anyway, let me go on. I believe only God, our Father, has all the answers. Prayers and blessings, many thanks, but personally, I believe once we start these rapture categories, it will only bring pride amongst the body of Christ, which our Abba does not want. I believe in one rapture. No one is perfect, even by great dedication or works. I cannot in my heart believe that our Abba will pick and choose. Because by stating all these more than one rapture, followers of Christ will feel that they're not good enough. I really appreciate your findings, my sister, and please forgive me coming out loud. I cannot believe God will divide and pick and choose his bride. We have a greater God. Let's give him some respect. Okay. Now, there are several things that I'm hoping, uh, and I, I did it just like that as you highly, uh, you know, as she had said, forgive me for coming out loud. So in other words, she's intending for the all caps to be loud, okay? And so that's why I'm doing that. But here, I, I thought that this represented a number of things and a number of things that I wanted to point out. She does not want to believe. And the reason why she says is she points out <laughs> she's not, and, and it's almost like, do you see what you're writing here? I'm not near perfect as in the bride, but I have full faith that I'm part of the body of Christ. So do I. So, so do I. Yeah, every, every part of the body the bride comes from the body. So every member of the, the a member of the bride is also a member of the body. Okay. So there's that's that's one of the things. But she has already separated herself because she's saying, I'm not near as perfect. So in other words, she's saying that we have to be perfect, or she's interpreting that. We're not perfect. None of us are perfect. And the only way that we are able to do anything is because our sin has been covered by the precious blood of Jesus. And that is not just for the bride. That's for any of the members of the body. That's how we become part of the body, right? All right. And uh, so she... She points out here again, uh, no one is perfect even by great dedication or works. Again, hyper-focused on this works. Salvation is not a work, but there are works that we are expected. What does God tell us? He says that we have works that he has beforehand. He's already created them for us, that we should walk in them, right? So once you are a born into the family, you have to be able to um, you have to be able to you have to be willing to walk that that journey. You have to be and and God has certain works that He has already prepared for you. And, uh, and this was done even before he, you were born. He, he knew all of this, right? And then, so in other words, that's, that's what I'm saying. The, your placement in whichever harvest group is a reward 
It is not connected with salvation. Salvation is only the starting gate, right? That you can't even enter the race if you're not at the starting line, right? And you can't go in the race until you are uh, one of the, the runners. And so that would be one of the believers. So you can't run the race, the Christian race. You can't run the Christian race unless you are a Christian. So that's what we're saying. This is salvation. But your attendance as a member of the bride is a reward that is covered many times. I, I've, I've covered that a number of times. And it's those, I believe, that have similar ideas like this, which say that they have to tie it into salvation, which is not, which is not. So that's how they can choose to be part of it. I, there can only be one, so I can be part of it. If there's more than one, then I might not be part of the first one because of all of these other reasons. They, they may not want or desire. They, they know that they're uh, that they have unrepentant sin and they don't want to, they don't want to get rid of their pet sins that they, they had themselves clean when they were, uh, when they were initially accepted, but we walk through this, uh, or run through this, whichever, if you call it the race and you get your feet dirty and Jesus says he wants to wash your feet. He said, he will wash your feet. How do you wash your feet? right? You have to ask for repentance for sin. We have sins that, that in our thoughts, our deeds, and things that happen because we're in this fallen flesh, and they are going to be fallen until we are transformed, right? And so just realize, you know, don't just keep doing it. Don't think that you're keeping it from Jesus, but you have to tell that you have to come to him with a heart of repentance, right? You, you have to ask for him to cleanse you of this. That's just one of the things you really, really need to do. All right. And so then uh, with uh, she then says, followers of Christ will feel that they are not good enough. And she's speaking with this broad brushstroke, which I think is more like projection. In other words, I'm not saying that uh, it's not me. Other believers might not feel good enough. No, what this person is saying is that she doesn't feel good enough. And I really think that in a lot of instances, it's not that at all. People are being convicted because the Holy Spirit is trying to get them to repent for these things, to turn away from the world. He wants these people, and he has picked out a bride. Yes, the Father has picked out the bride. That's the way it's done. And he has done that. But I'm encouraging you, you have the opportunity now to turn away from the world. Turn away from the world. Don't love anything in the world. He says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. That would not be good, right? Yes, we live in the world, but it says we are not of the world. So don't get yourself just immersed in the mire of this world, right? And, uh, and I can't believe that God will divide and pick and choose his bride when exactly that is exactly what he does. And that is exactly what the word says he will do. Jesus says, I didn't come uh, uh, but to bring a sword, right? That's what he came to do. He came to bring a sword. And what do you do with a sword? You cut and divide. That's he. Oh, my goodness. Yes, there is a reason for that. And I think a lot of things also that tends to point out that some people, maybe you're a mother, maybe you're a mother, and let me speak to you for a minute, and, and your children are the most important thing to you forever. 
Okay, they're the most important thing to you. And, and you just can't imagine leaving them behind. You're so focused on them. Now, is it wrong to focus on your children? Well, of course not. But what I'm saying is that there's going to be, that's a good thing. But when Jesus comes in the air, you have to be able to put everything in his hands. It's not your hands that they need to be in. It's in God's hands. So he can take much better care of them, sorry to say, than you can. So let's let him take care of them. Perhaps you love your pet more. I just can't, I don't want to go if I can't take Fluffy with me. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I understand the love of pets. I certainly do. But when that trumpet sounds, leave your pets in God's hands, okay? That's what I'm saying. If, if, if you're looking to try to get that next promotion, if you're looking at trying to buy that house or to have kids or grandkids or whatever, those types of things, if you're looking at everything that is supposed to be successful here on earth, then I'm saying your focus on that is going to put you in very precarious places. Because remember, as Jesus said to do, remember Lot's wife. Now, I want to point out something. What did Lot's wife do? She was actually taken out of the city by, in Sodom and Gomorrah. She actually made it part way out, but she didn't make it all the way to Zohar. She didn't do that like Lot and his two daughters did. She looked back and we understand that that looking back is longingly for the things that she's leaving behind. She longed for the things that she was leaving, her home, her you know, oh, I loved shopping at this particular shop, or I, you know, I, I had these friends, or my family members, my big extended family, they're all back there. I'm wondering about them. Who's going to take care of them? God takes care of them. But he's trying to make a point. Jesus is saying, remember Lot's wife, because you, sister, you, brother, you, uh, young teenager, young unmarried, whatever. If you are looking back when that trumpet sounds, you are going to be left here. And there are, it's not just me saying it. It's not just me saying it. There are so many instances of the number of people that have had tribulation uh, dreams or rapture dreams where they, they went up and actually say this, that in the dream, they were left behind because they looked back or they thought about their parents or they thought about their children or something like that, just like that. And as they were going up, but then when they had those thoughts, they came back down. Don't let that happen to you. This, this separation is happening now. And what is that separation going to mean? That means that the bride is going to be taken in the first rapture. That means this clear separation with the body is going to mean that the body is going to be left behind, okay? And that's what's going to happen. You may not like it, but the truth of the matter is not, that's not negotiable, right? We're just trying to tell you that's what's going to happen. And we're giving you an opportunity to, for you to, to repent of those things, to look at these things in this different way, to ask, ask Jesus to give you the ability to, to lay everything in his hands. We ask Jesus to give you the faith and the trust. That's what it comes down to, right? I want to hold on to my kids. Because what you're saying is, I don't trust you enough to take care of them the way I would. And that's actually really the wrong way to look at it.
All right. All right. So here's what we come down to this final takeaway. And, uh, and that is this, that these, uh, these uh, two visions that I had, the, the one vision with the sharp knife, and then the two instances with the cleaver, it's also showing me how close we are. That cleaver has come down and the separation was complete in this instance. Now, some people uh, like to say that no, uh, that he's not going to separate, he being God, is not going to separate the bride from the body because you know he's not going to leave any part of his body here. And I'm thinking like, um, Jesus would be the head of the body, right? And is he with the body right now? No, he's in heaven. So can we have a part of the body that's in heaven and the rest of the body here on earth? Yes, we can. Can he take another part of the body to heaven and leave the rest of it on earth? Well, of course he can, right? So that's, and so if we look at uh, the Adam instance, uh, the bride was made outside of where Adam was. And then the word tells us that the bride, Eve, the woman, was brought to Adam. What's going to happen? The bride of Jesus is going to be taken to be where Jesus is. And he's going to come into the clouds in the air. And that's what's going to happen. Brothers and sisters, I hope this is just uh, is going to be helpful. Um, uh, we're, we're looking at, at everything. It is so incredibly close. So many people now are just so focused and many, many more are coming to this, I, uh, coming to this conclusion that we are here. They even think and that understanding that it can happen at any moment, at any moment. And that is really the case. Pray. Luke uh, 20, uh, 21, 36, watch ye therefore, don't, don't say what anybody else says that, yeah, the word says to watch, but you don't have to watch. Yes, you do. Or the word wouldn't say to watch, right? Yeah, kind of like, let me just give this a little uh, tidbit in here. There are 24 instances in the word where you are commanded, it's a command, to watch. Right? That's a command. Did you know that there's another thing that where it says, do not fear? Do you know how many times it says not to fear in the Bible? 365 times, one for every single day of the year. Okay? Do not fear. Well, what does he mean? It's, it's okay to fear. No, he makes it a very emphatic statement. Do not fear. Another command. So why then do we want to look at that when we look at the command to watch for his, for his coming, for his appearing, and we say, oh, that's okay. Yeah, you don't really have to watch. I know that's what the word says, but no, you don't have to worry about it. You're good. But then you're more than happy to uh, quote the scriptures where it says, you know, that not to fear, right? Mm, noticing a bit of a disconnect here. I hope that you do. So here's what I would say. First off, don't fear. Because, and that's what he says, don't fear these things that are coming on the earth, right? They are signs for us to know just how close Jesus is to coming for his bride. Watch ye therefore and pray always to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are coming on this earth and to stand before the Son of Man. I pray that you will also pray that prayer. Do it now in Jesus' name. All right. God bless you all and Maranatha. All righty. Bye bye now.